Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm Scott Clonney, Director of Exhibitions and Public Programs. Thanks for joining us. Tonight's program is part of Architecture Everywhere, a monthly series organized by the Washington Architectural Foundation, exploring how architecture comes to life in unexpected ways through other arts and humanities disciplines. In this presentation, we welcome award-winning New York City-based scenic designer, Beowulf Borat. Borat's expertise spans Broadway, Off-Broadway, regional theater, circus, dance, opera, and television. Tonight, he will share the ins and outs of designing sets for theatrical plays and musicals, and reveal how architecture translates scripts into performative environments that impact the audience experience. I'll put a link to Beowulf's portfolio in the chat. With that, a few housekeeping notes. By participating in this webinar, you are granting your permission to be recorded and for the recording to be distributed as AIADC and the Washington Architectural Foundation may choose. If you have any questions or comments during the program, please use the Q&A or chat features and we'll follow up with those afterwards. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our speaker, Beowulf Borat. Beowulf, thanks for being with us. Hi, how are you? Um, so I'm gonna dive in and talk to you guys a little bit about uh, scenic design for the theater. James Lapine, the Pulitzer Prize and Tony Award winning writer and director of Sunday in the Park with George wrote, white, a blank page or canvas, his favorite, so many possibilities. And Harold Prince, the uh, winner of a record 21 Tony Awards for his direction and producing wrote, uh, told me once, you want a lot of air, you want a lot of blank spaces, you want the audience to be complicit in the production to fill in the blank spots. No two people will imagine the same wallpaper or furniture, but they'll be participating. How you get from the infinite white page possibilities to the perfect compelling details, allowing the audience participation is what I strive to do with set design. And in fact, I'm about to publish a book uh, exploring that exact thing. So I'm gonna talk to you guys a bit about that. Theater is at heart a literary form. It's actors conveying a story largely through a writer's words to an audience. And if that story is well told, you might not really need anything else. So scenic design, what I do is kind of frosting. You don't strictly need it, but like frosting on a good cake, it can enhance the experience of a story. And I definitely prefer my cake with frosting. And lastly, I'll say scenery, scenery for the theater is sculpture. It's inhabited by living people, actors, and it exists in front of an audience for a set period of time. And that's key to it. The audience experiences it for 90 minutes or two hours, however long the play is, but it's a set period. And in that time, the sculpture can transform in concert with the telling of the story to help contextualize the way the audience experiences that story. It provides a, a visual narrative in tandem with the actor's spoken narrative. And sometimes that narrative is just location. Literally, we're in a living room, we're in a garden, we're on a boat, whatever. But at its best, scenery starts to spin a thematic narrative, providing information about the deeper meaning of the play and supporting the rhythms of the storytelling. So on that note, with that preamble, I'm gonna dive in and talk about some productions I've designed that uh, will help illustrate this. And I'm gonna do a screen share so I can show you guys some, some slides as I go along. James Lapine's play, Act One, was based on a, a autobiography by Moss Hart, who's a famous early 20th century playwright who wrote many plays with his partner, George Kaufman. Um, the, Moss Hart wrote a memoir about his early days in the theater during the depression and Lapine translat, translated that into a stage play, which I designed on Broadway a couple of years ago. When I was first handed the play, it was about 50 locations, which is a lot, and they came in very quick succession. It was also about 100, 180 pages long. And for reference, that's long for a play. The normal play is maybe 100 pages, maybe a little over, but that's about two hours of stage time. So 180 pages, we're looking at a three and a half hour play. Long, and it had a lot of locations. And further, it had a lot of locations that like a Kaufman and Hart play required realistic things. It needed a working kitchen, Think in one scene with a table that, that worked next, lived next to it. Another scene, we were in an office and we needed a secretary at a desk with a working typewriter and then a door you could knock on to get into an inner office with another desk with more things on it. The point is that it had realistic things. You've probably all seen plays where there's a couple of actors on an empty stage and they kind of conjure the whole world for you. And that is really theater at its doing its sort of theatrical magic at its best. 
But this play was requiring something different. It needed a degree of reality to its locations. Another challenge is the scenes were not very long in general. Some of them were long, but a lot of them were about a page long. So maybe 30 seconds of stage time and frequently with just a couple actors on stage. So it wasn't big crowd scenes. It was a couple of people in a short, quick scene. Now, if I've got 50 scenes in a row and they're short scenes, the scene changes cannot be very long from one to the next. If I've got 50 scenes and each scene change takes even 20 seconds, that's a lot of time you're gonna spend watching scenery move. And I'm not interested in that even as the set designer. It starts to kill the rhythm of the storytelling. So I had to find a way to get us from place to place very quickly, um, but in a way that wouldn't step on the, the sort of mood of the play. So that was kind of my narrative challenge that I was faced with. How do I get all of these physical things and the indication of where we are out onto the stage in a way that will, will not bog down the storytelling? Now, the thematic challenge was a little different. When I first sat down with my writer director, James Lapine, we talked for a while about what the play was about. But one of the things he said to me that really stuck is, this is a memoir written about a young man. He's in his early 20s. He's an ambitious young guy. He's coming from very little money and trying to rise in the world. But he has the energy and the ambition of a young person. And James said, I have this image of him running up and down a lot of stairs and, uh, and banging on a lot of doors. So that gave me the thematic information I needed to start figuring out how I was going to tell this story. And finally, we were doing this in a very big Broadway theater at Lincoln Center. Uh, it, it's about 65 feet wide. A normal Broadway theater is maybe 38, 40 feet wide. So it was a good bit wider than a normal Broadway theater, which was yet another challenge, meaning I had to get the, whatever scenery I was going to get to the sort of center of the stage where we were telling the story, it had to get there quickly and also smoothly so that we weren't watching it come trundling on from 30 feet away. Um, the last thing I was thinking about as I was doing all this is I needed to pro provide realistic things, but I didn't want to provide it in a completely realistic way. Again, taking into account what I just said to you that Hal Prince had said to me about leaving empty space, blank space for the audience to fill it in. That was important and also just having it not feel heavy so you weren't looking at a big lumbering thing moving around. The idea that I hit on in the end after a couple of false starts was essentially to build a, a version of New York City that was kind of like a big carousel. We, we put a revolving set on the stage, a big revolving turntable in the middle of the stage that was 60 feet in diameter. And on that, I built a structure out of wooden beams, but it was kind of like a line drawing. It was wooden beams that outlined the different locations, but there were no walls with any of them. They would have windows floating in kind of empty space. Now this is a flattened out elevation showing the entire thing. So this is, this is as if I took the carousel and flattened it out. We had a big townhouse on one side. We had Moss Hart's tenement apartment in the middle of it. We had a theater location on the other side. Uh, there were many scenes that took place in a theater. And then between each of those, I had kind of empty neutral spaces, sort of open spaces here, here, here. And into those spaces, I could put other props to begin to define uh, what the scenes were and what we were in each location. So some of these places that we came back to multiple times, I, I had a little more fully realized. Others I would just indicate with a couple of pieces of, of props or furniture that I brought in for that particular scene to help define it. Again, because the scenes were short, often 30 seconds, the audience didn't have too much time to stare at the location. So a couple of key elements could, could define where we were. Here's a top view, a plan view of the theater and this, this turntable. So this is a 60 foot diameter circle here. And you can see again from the top, I had a section that was a mansion, a section that was a tenement, a section that was a theater, and then neutral spaces between each of those, which I could fill in with different things. Then I began to work through the play scene by scene. And I made a tracking document. This is just one page of what was about a 50 page document ultimately. But I went through and just noted each scene that we were going, what was happening, how many pages long that scene was. Often they were just part of a page, but that gave me a, a sense of how long the duration of the scene was. And I just made a note of all the things that I might need in that scene. Chairs for actors to sit on, some backstage stuff. Another scene was in an office, so I had show posters for the producer whose office it was. And with that information, I began to really kind of chart the, the transition of space over time and how it was going to get us from place to place in the course of the play. And I built a three-dimensional model of this idea. So here are some pictures of the model. This is a quarter-inch scale model. 
all of the furniture and props put into it. And this is something that I could use to work with both the shop that was building this scenery and also with the director and the actors to explain to them how it was gonna work before they got onto the, the real finished set. Uh, this is Moss Hart's tenement. Again, a kind of a, a bleak place you don't wanna live. There's a bit of laundry floating uh, on laundry lines above it, a water tower up above it. Uh, here's a scene of the stairwell of that tenement when we were focusing on people up on the roof. Uh, but the, the entire rest of the set sort of into silhouette with the lighting. And as you can see, it's a very skeletal open framework. This is the theater set I mentioned earlier. There was a, a sort of, again, a skeletal proscenium arch with a curtain that could rise and lower and reveal other scenery inside of it. There was a, some box seats and then an upper balcony. There was a key scene where we had 16 actors sitting in the upper balcony watching a play. Uh, here's the same set with a little, uh, a little bit of scenery inside it. Mosshart's first play was a Western called The Beloved Bandit. And in the book, he describes it as having the ugliest green set I ever saw. And so I tried to design the ugliest green set I could to fit within this and help define that scene. And then here is George Kaufman's uh, big uh, gracious mansion, which, which Mosshart arrives at in the second act as, as the two partner and begin to write a Broadway show. And this is kind of the, the castle of the fairy tale, so to speak. It's an elegant, uh, elegant fancy built apartment, or excuse me, a house, townhouse, of a man who succeeded on Broadway and, and making a good living with a grand staircase leading up to a second story study and a big uh, downstairs where we had a big party scene. Uh, and here are some pictures of the actual set itself. So this is once we took all these ideas and actually put them into effect. So you've got actors down here. This is the tenement again, a kind of a very dark space and people crammed into a very small space. One of the advantages of the way I laid out this set with a bunch of uh, little cubicles sort of built around this turntable, around this carousel, is that it made each of the spaces of these, these small tenements quite com compact. It made the, a human being feel sort of large and important within that space, and it helped focus the eye, eye in a way that a camera would in a movie, but in a way the set has to do with the lighting on stage. Uh, here is the realization of George Kaufman's uh, townhouse. So again, you can see it's a large open space, this large downstairs living room and a luxurious office with big grand uh, windows up above. This is the stairwell again. This is a key scene in the play when Moss Hart, living in his tenement, gets a phone call from a producer saying they're gonna do his play on Broadway. And it's a tenement, so there's only a, a phone in the stairwell. There were, you heard the phone ring on the second floor. The neighbor came out, came out of her second floor apartment and answered the phone. She yelled down to Moss Hart's mother who came running up the stairs and yelled for Moss who's up on the roof. He comes down from the roof to answer the phone. And then over on this side, you can see the producer who's called him from a different location. So the set manages to provide all those locations all at once, kind of in, in one instant. Uh, this is a moment towards the end of the first act. Again, he's aware that he's going to have this play produced on Broadway. It's, his, his dream is coming true. And it's the one piece of scenery that I added to the show. We flew in from above a bunch of marquees of Broadway theaters. And as they slowly flew in, they lit up. And it was, it was the white lights of Broadway turning on as Moss begins to see that his, his dream is, is being fulfilled. This is one of the theater sets, uh, a scene where he's, uh, they're producing the Emperor Jones and you can see there was a little bit of kind of tacky scenery, very flat scenery stuffed in there. This is the one I showed you earlier, the ugly green set of the beloved bandit, another scene in the same location. And this is an example of one of the neutral spaces. So this is four pictures of the exact same spot on the set, but it's been redressed from scene to scene. So early in the show, we're in a, a kind of a, a not very well-to-do producer's office. The guy does a lot of traveling road shows. He has bulletin boards of train schedules everywhere and a big map of the United States. And those are kind of the salient features in this kind of brown and grim office. When we come back a little bit later, we've made the same thing into a different producer's office. This is the guy who's producing the Emperor Jones. And so he has a big poster for that. The bulletin boards have been replaced by windows with green blinds in them, but it's actually the same desk here. So the audience isn't seeing these scenes long enough to note some of the details. So the, the sort of bright colorful details are the things that begin to define where we are in, from scene to scene. And then we come back to the same location again, it's an even fancier office. We've got a better chair, different posters on the wall, different blinds in the windows. So again, we're, we're changing little details to help locate the audience. And then finally, when we come back again, it's a theater dressing room. The curtains have changed again. The desk has been transformed into a, a actor's dressing table with a mirror and, and dressing room lights. And there's a dressing screen in the corner. 
but it's the same space over and over again to uh, used in slightly different ways. Um, and I'm going to show you just quickly, uh, this is a short video that Live from Lincoln Center made. They filmed the show and they did a little uh, promo piece that talked about the set a little, and it demonstrates some of how the, uh, um, the set works. So I'm going to click onto this. I felt I really wanted to use the full depth of the theater, which isn't often employed because it's so unbelievably deep. And I had this idea of this kind of carousel that there might be a fluidity to the staging of the piece uh, that would be able to employ the entire stage itself. When I read the script the first time, I thought, oh my God, it's a movie. It's a lot of little tight two-person scenes set a kind of against a kind of an epic backdrop. And the set compositionally tries to solve that on stage. When you watch a two minute scene and you go into another two minute scene, you can't have a one minute scene change in between those two or it would destroy the pace of the play. So the scene changes all had to be as instantaneous as they could be. All throughout the process, that was kind of the big challenge is how do you keep the spaces in physical proximity to each other and keep the story moving along. We were introduced to the set the way most actors are introduced with a model. So we got, you know, a little picture of kind of like, oh, this is what it is and it'll move like this. And and that's all we knew. When we got up on the stage and we saw it for the first time, it was overwhelming T to the point of being terrifying, really. Then you add on top of it the spinning top of a set that um, I have to climb <laughs> and figure out where am I going and what's next? How do I not run into something, which I have almost run into that set multiple times. I have so many fast changes, as many of us do. It took me a few days to figure out <laughs> where the audience was after a while, which, which was stage right and left, uh, where I was going to enter from, who I was playing, how I was going to get there fast enough to make my entrance. I always have kind of thought of the set as, a, as an homage to New York and, and New York City as a metaphor for kind of life in the theater. I, one of the things that I love about New York is the way parts of the city are old, parts are new, but it's constantly rebuilding itself and new things piled on top of old things and everything jammed in against itself. It feels very much like the kind of crazy energy of, of life in the theater where you've got this piled against that and you never know what's coming next. We wanted to create a world. We wanted to create a sense of this big world that he's conquering. The Broadway moment at the end of the first act is one of my favorite. And I kept thinking, we've got to do something great here. And it worked better than I ever could have imagined. The first time we tried it in the theater and turned the lights on and sort of had those signs come floating in, I, it sort of stunned everybody. Moss Hart's world is spinning. And he has to keep on it or it's going to go away. So my job every night is really informed by the design. I have to keep going up and down those stairs as Moss Hart did. It has energy and it gives energy. As it turns and as you're moving through it and up and down, it's sort of radiating this energy into you and it, and it feeds all of us. So that was that was Act One. I'm gonna that was I am told the biggest turntable in in Broadway history. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I but I will I will keep telling that story. Um, I'm gonna shift from that to actually a very very small set. Um, I was talking about how uh, you know sort of very little scenery often leaves more room for the audience's imagination. And this is a play that I did that had almost no scenery in it that also played on Broadway. It was called The Scottsboro Boys. It was a musical created by John Kander and Fred, Fred Ebb, the songwriting team behind Cabaret in Chicago. And they created this musical with the book writer David Thompson and the director choreographer Susan Stroman. Now, if you've never heard of The Scottsboro Boys, it was a, a famous case in the 1930s. It was one of the sort of the early big civil rights movement cases. There were nine young black men on a train moving through the South, and they were dragged off the train in Scottsboro, Alabama, and accused of raping two white women and thrown in jail. And uh, the, they were uh, put on trial in a sham trial, sentenced, many of them were sentenced to death for this, but it caught, uh, it caught the news and it became a national case and people came down from the North to protest it. 
Um, and the case dragged on for many, many years. The Scottsboro boys were finally pardoned a few years ago by the governor of Alabama, I think. But it, at the time, it was an important case. It was big national news. Rosa Parks, as a young woman, was involved in, uh, in the protests uh, trying to free the Scottsboro boys. So that sounds like just the right thing for a musical comedy, right? Um, how to tell that story was, was even more controversial, perhaps. Uh, our creative team decided they would tell the story by using the, uh, the medium of a minstrel show. And again, if you're lucky enough not to know what a minstrel show is, it is a, a racist form of theater that has, I believe pretty much it, it disappeared from the world, but it was the most popular form of theater in the United States for about a hundred years, from the 1850s until the 1950s, they were everywhere. They were kind of variety shows. And sometimes black people, often white people, would play buffoonish black characters, usually in blackface. Um, and it was a series of songs and skits about, frankly, how stupid black people were. Um, what our creative team did was they took that idea and turned it on its head and, and attempted to tell a kind of postmodern version of an instal show. So what we had was a cast of all black men telling this story. And they told the they played the characters of the Scottsboro Boys as realistic human characters. So you understood them, you sort of saw their hopes and dreams, you understood the pain they were going through. And they also stepped out of those roles and they played the the redneck sheriff who was who was dragging these guys off the train, but they played him as a kind of ridiculous buffoonish white stereotype. So it took some of the conventions of a minstrel show and flipped them upside down to tell this story. Um, and Susan Stroman, who was directing and choreographing, when we began to talk about what the set would be for this story, and again, it had a lot of locations. We started kind of in a minstrel show world, and then we very quickly went to a train moving through uh, through Alabama. Uh, then we were uh, on the on the at the train station in Scottsboro, and then in a jail cell, and then in a courtroom, and so on for many many locations. And what she said to me early on was, she wanted to try to tell this story in a simple way, and that. For a minstrel show, the tradition was there would be a semicircle of chairs on the stage and the performers would all sit in those chairs and they would get up when they got to their scene and, and they would come down center and do their, their little scene or their song, whatever it was. Um, and that was what she wanted to do to tell this story, but she wanted me to take those chairs and use them to create any location that we needed to create uh, throughout the show. I'm gonna jump back into a screen share here. Um, here's a, a rendering I did of the Scottsboro Boys. This was when I began to work out how could I take some chairs and begin making them into other things? How could I take some chairs and make them sturdy enough that I could stack one chair on top of another and lay perhaps a plank on top of it so people could stand on top of that? And we could say that was a box car. I could take two chairs and with a little pin hidden in the, in the back of the chair, I could stand one on top of the other. And with bars on the back, it looks a little bit like a jail cell window. Again, I could stack the chairs up in a different way to create a little solitary confinement cell that we use later in the show. Now, to look at these, you're probably thinking, well, I'm not sure I would know that was any of those things. This doesn't really look like a boxcar. This doesn't really look like a jail cell and so on. The set is only doing part of the storytelling in this case. And I will, in a minute, I'll get into how we use these chairs to create the locations in conjunction with, with lighting and sound and other things. But the chairs weren't all I was going to do. I needed some kind of a surround. I didn't want just an empty stage. I wanted a little bit of something around the, the actors and the chairs as they reconfigured them. And that, again, is getting into sort of the, the thematic work that a set is doing. The chairs were going to help tell the narrative to let us know we're in a boxcar, we're in a jail, and so on. But I wanted to surround that with something a little more thematic. And as I thought about the Scottsboro Boys, it wasn't a story I'd known before I began working on the show. And what it seemed like to me was kind of a ghost story and kind of a story about an uncomfortable thing from American history that I didn't know about. It made me a little uncomfortable to learn about it. And it reminded me of when I was a kid growing up in rural Pennsylvania. I was going for a walk in my parents' woods one time and I, I stumbled onto the skeleton of a, I think a deer or maybe a cow that had died long, long ago. But the skeleton was kind of rising up out of the ground and it was spooky and a little bit scary, a little bit uncomfortable. It looked kind of like this. 
And that reminded me of architecture as it begins to disintegrate and fall apart, the way lab and plaster begins to disintegrate, and it feels like you're seeing the bones of, of the architecture. I took those ideas and combined them into a, a kind of a vaudeville proscenium that was, was beginning to molder and fall away. I painted it all white to kind of make it feel more like bones. And that was my idea for what I would surround these chairs with, something that was sort of the vaudeville world of a minstrel show, but also felt like it was the kind of the bones of, of the story arising out of the out of the out of history. Now, interestingly, when I presented this idea to Susan Stroman, she thought it was too much. She thought it was actually a little bit too much scenery. And she said, could I come up with something a little more simple? So I took this idea and I scaled it back. And this is what we came up with in the end. It was kind of three very simple frames that were a little off kilter to each other. Um, and that was because, you know, this is the world where justice is not working properly. Justice is a little off kilter. I also felt like these guys, these men, as they were thrown in jail, they were kind of in purgatory and kind of floating through space. And I wanted a sense that they were a little unmoored. The gravity wasn't working quite right. They were kind of floating away, trapped in this, in this purgatory. Um, these frames also, in a very simple way, kind of recall a proscenium. So they were, again, a little bit of a reference to vaudeville in that sense. And in my mind, they were also kind of the rib cage that I had started thinking about. They were these sort of ribs made of wooden beams that surrounded the story. Now, I'm not sure to look at them, you would think any of those things. And part of what worked about this set is it was so simple and so open that it kind of allowed the audience to lay their own ideas on top of it, however they wanted. Um, within that, I did this, this old oleo that looks like a 19th century vaudeville backdrop that said the Scottsboro Boys that, that started us off. It went away fairly quickly as the story started. But it, again, it helped set us in this vaudeville world. And then you can see the, uh, the chairs lined up here that they're going to tell the story with. So at the beginning of the play, they started in this minstrel show semicircle within, within this framework with the oleo backdrop behind them. And they did a very show busy opening number with a lot of dance in it, very exciting, a lot of running around and, and dancing throughout. And fairly quickly, they launch into the narrative of the story. So the actors themselves pick up those chairs, they begin moving them around. It was, there was a very quick choreographed moment, a swirl of action, and suddenly we're on a train. So they've taken the chairs, they've stacked them up, they've used some, grabbed some tambourines they were using in the opening number and put them on the edges of the chairs to kind of look like wheels. These planks are laid across them. And in this same moment, the both the music and the sound effects start giving you the rattle and the chug a chug of a train moving down the tracks and you can't see it in the still picture but the lighting designer began to to have moving light pass across these guys so you got a sense of movement and light passed across the backdrop behind them and the combination of all of those things told you you were on a train with very little scenery very little there you suddenly knew you were on a train so they they chug along for a while suddenly the train stops they get pulled off by the sheriff and, and accused of rape and thrown in jail. And again, in a flurry of action, in about 20 seconds, all these chairs got picked up, moved around by the actors, laid down in a different way. Some of the chairs were stacked end on end, on end with the bars visible. And the lighting focused us in very, very tightly into this little square of space. And there was a sound effect of a steel door clanging shut. And suddenly you knew you were in a jail cell. So the combination of all of those things began to create a real theatrical magic with very few elements in a very theatrical way, we were letting the audience know where we were and they began to understand the convention that these chairs are gonna just keep reconfiguring in different ways and, and telling us where we are. Now, I mentioned earlier that one of the scenes was a character has been thrown into solitary confinement. We found this, this awful picture. This is from a convict camp in Georgia from the 1940s, so slightly after our play took place. But again, it's a bunch of black men locked in us in, this is not solitary confinement, but locked in this underground cell. Our version of that was this look where we stacked the chairs up, we took our lead character and he was locked inside there and, and very, very tightly contained for that scene. But again, we're using the, the chairs that we've established to create all of these different locations. Now, occasionally we broke those rules. We didn't always use just chairs. I, you saw I had a couple of planks that we had there was one scene where we brought out a, a white sheet that we could use as a, as a shadow backdrop. This is another vaudeville convention where you, you have a light shining on a backdrop and people's shadows create a story and the audience is on the, on, the, on the other side of the backdrop. So we did a version of that where we had a, a sheet that was on just two poles shoved into the chairs. And we told this kind of novelty story of a character who is, who is learning that he needs to tell the truth. Um, and ultimately, he, he doesn't ever learn to tell the truth. And so he ends up dying and trying to go to heaven. 
we used the chairs to create kind of the stairway to heaven and we, the sheet on its two poles became St. Peter's wings um, as, he, as this character is ascending to heaven. But St. Peter in a final indignity tells him he's not allowed to come into heaven through the front door. He has to come in through the back door because he's black. So again, the, the story keeps kind of hammering home some of these truths of, uh, of segregated America. Finally, at the very end of the show, we had one more big surprise for the audience. Um, the, those frames, those portals that I had set up, they all flipped around and created a, a different kind of a world. They had light bulbs hidden inside them that could chase and, uh, and flash, like again, like the light bulbs on a vaudeville show. Um, sort of this was the inspiration. This was an old burlesque show thing, but you can imagine these kind of tacky old light bulbs with you know, visible wires run between them. It looks kind of cheap and homemade, but it has sort of an old vaudeville aesthetic to it. All of our portals flipped around and suddenly the world became full of light bulbs. That Scottsboro boys oleo drop flew in at the back and the cast all appeared in top hats and tailcoats. And for the first time in the show, they were all wearing blackface as well. And there, there's an agreement amongst everyone who did it that we don't actually show pictures of the blackface. So the, the guys are all in silhouette in this picture, but they did one entire number all in blackface. And it was really jarring to see these characters who you've gotten to know and gotten to appreciate as individuals suddenly in this, this kind of caricaturish awful way. And they did most of this musical number and then suddenly they stopped and they said, we're not doing this anymore. They wiped the blackface off, they knocked all the chairs over and they walked off stage taking control of their, of their own story again. Um, I'm gonna pause just for a sec and stop the share. So that's a very different kind of storytelling. That's using very, very minimal stuff to, to tell again a story with a lot of locations and using kind of uh, theater magic and the audience's imagination to help, help fill in the blanks for us. The last play I'm gonna talk about quickly is, is a different kind of transformation. This is a show that actually, a set that didn't transform at all. It was a production of Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing that I did in New York for Shakespeare in the Park uh, two years ago, right before the pandemic. Um, the director, Kenny Leon, wanted to tell this story as a modern day version of Much Ado About Nothing. Kenny does kind of sociological, political plays. And when we went into it, I, I think I went in thinking you can't do political theater without it starting to feel didactic and uncomfortable. And uh, I'm not sure I was quite ready to go, for, go along for the ride. And I will say that Kenny did it so skillfully that he converted me to the possibility of doing political theater that is both entertaining and informative at the same time. We started out, again, as I said, we talked about the play for a bit. I knew much ado about nothing. I'd done it before in, in more traditional settings. But Kenny said he wanted, this was in 2019, he said, I want it to be 2020. I want it to be a little bit in the future. And I want it to be in Atlanta, specifically the Atlanta suburbs. And I want there to be a big banner on stage that says Stacey Abrams 2020. Um, and I said, okay, that, that sounds good. Um, we, we can do all that. And then he said, at the beginning of the show, they're coming home from a war. And so we need this, the soldiers coming back from the war at the beginning of this play. And I said, oh, if it's modern day, do you mean they're coming back from Iraq or Afghanistan? And he said, no, they're coming back from the war that's going on in America right now. And it kind of stopped me dead because I didn't know what he meant at first. And then I thought, oh, well, of course, he's, he's a black man and he's watching other black men being killed. Um, and how do you think of that as anything but a war? And it was a, a kind of a realignment for me. I would have described, you know, what, what goes on in America often as a civil rights violation. I don't think I would have described it as a war, but that reframing sort of allowed me to think about the play in a different way. Shakespeare does have his characters coming back from a war at the beginning of the play, and then they don't mention it again until the very end of the play. And that opened a window for me in how to think about this story. I'm gonna jump back into a screen share here. Uh, again, so this is a rendering of the finished set, but when I started out, what I was actually working with was the Delacorte Theater in Central Park. So you can see it's a big open space. Again, it's a big stage. It's about 75 feet wide. And in the background, there's a big castle, there's a lake, there's a lot of trees. And all of that is there. That's all going to be part of my set, no matter what I do. I, I can build something down here that will cover up some of it. But whatever I do, those things are going to be in the background. 
And that was one of the things I started thinking about as I began to figure out how do I tell this story of Much Ado About Nothing and how do I reframe this, this Elizabethan play so that it seems like it's taking place in Georgia in, uh, in you know, not only in modern days, slightly in the future. Um, because the script is not gonna tell me that, the set actually has to provide a lot of that information. So it's a different design challenge. The set has to literally take, take some literature and help you understand that it's taking place in a different place than that play was actually written to, to take place in. So I sat down and started figuring out how do I fill this space up in a way that tells, tells us we're in the Atlanta suburbs. And I started out doing a very, very rough, this is a very crude model. Um, and I'm gonna just show you sort of the process I went through figuring out what this set was. This picture, in fact, is not anything I even showed my director. I was literally just saying, if this is how big a person is on a stage this big, what can I put there to begin to fill in that stage and, and sort of frame the person to make them feel important? And how do what, you know, how big does the house need to be to start to fill that stage? So this is a very crude model, but it's just some pieces I'm sticking together to figure out how the space works. Another thing that seemed worth playing with is in many Shakespeare plays, he was writing for the Globe Theater. And one of the truths about the Globe Theater is there is a there's an upper balcony that's very useful in a Shakespeare play. It helps you stage the play often to have an upper level and a way to get there for the actors. It doesn't have to look like the Globe Theater, but, but stairs and an, and an upper level can be useful. And Much Ado, in fact, has several scenes where one character's eavesdropping on another character. And so a place they can hide, an upper level they can go to to hide can be very, very useful. I then took these kind of rough ideas and started working out a, a more refined version of it that I could actually show to Kenny, my director, and say, how about this? And you can see I put in, uh, I, I printed out an image of Central Park in the background. So I would have the trees there to figure out how, um, you know, how they related in scale to what I was putting on stage. I kept thinking maybe I should do a lake house because there was a lake behind us and maybe, maybe that would be an appropriate setting for this. And I started playing with some kind of modern architecture and, and how could I make this look good? Um, and I showed this rough to Kenny and he said, that seems okay. We, you know, why don't you keep playing with that and try to make it look a little more realistic? One of the things you'll see here, and it was a trap that I kind of fell into, is I was just using white cardstock. So this whole set is white and it looks kind of elegant because of that. However, our cast was gonna be all black people. And it's not a great idea to put a bright white set behind a black cast because the set is gonna end up being brighter than the cast faces. And you really want your actors to be the, the brightest, most prominent thing on stage. Especially in an outdoor theater like this, most of the lighting is coming in at kind of low angles. There's, there's, no, there's no lighting grid above the stage. It's all coming in from kind of behind the audience. So it's very, very flat lighting. And if I'm trying to hit this actor here with a spotlight, it's also gonna hit all the scenery right behind him. And so a white set with black performers, honestly, even a white set with, with Caucasian performers is probably not the best idea in this location. So I took this same idea and remade it in darker materials. Um, and I showed it to Kenny and he looked at it and he said, you know what, this doesn't look fancy enough. This is supposed to, the guy who owns this house is supposed to be very wealthy. At the beginning of the show, an army of like 30 or 40 people shows up to stay for the weekend and it's not a problem. It has to be a house that's fancy enough, that's wealthy enough that it, that, that seems realistic, that these people are all showing up and there's a place for them just to sleep. So I went back to the drawing board and I came up with this idea. Um, I was I started using brick as a as a material that would both feel maybe wealthier, but also and feel like a good building material and also set off the black performers face as well in a way that they would feel prominent. Um, Kenny mentioned to me that he wanted these characters to seem very patriotic so we put a, a flag on stage, and I had an idea that if we had a car upstage it would again help set us in modern times. At the beginning of the show, that car could drive in, and some of the some of this army could pile out of the car, and it was sort of a fun way to start the show, um, but mostly just to to make sure the audience was clear we were we were set in modern times. Um, and here is a more finished version of the same set as we continue to refine it. That first one I showed you was kind of a, a paste up cardboard set. This is a much more uh, dimensional uh, model where, where the brick and the stone all has dimension to it. And I'm really beginning to sort out what I want the set to be, what the materials are. I decided to make part of the house stone instead of just brick so that it, it gave some, some life and some history to the place as if there was a stone house with a brick addition. I added a staircase to get the actors up and down to this upper level. Um, I, I did a bunch of peach trees in an orchard because we're Georgia after all. I thought Georgia peaches would help tell that story. Um, and so that's, that is the set that we eventually decided to go ahead and build on stage. 
uh, here's a quick set of elevations that my assistant drew up. So in this sense, it is a bit like being an architect. I, I don't need the engineering background that an architect needs, but the process of building a house is, is somewhat similar for a stage designer. Um, and here in fact is the house being built and we built it uh, outdoors in the park. And again, much like you might build a house, it was a, it was a two by four stud wall and plywood construction. And then on top of that, we used fake brick that, that we could buy in four by eight sheets to layer onto that. So we didn't have to, to put every brick in place. Um, but the, the base structure of it actually is, is similar to a real house. Um, and you can see this is early in the year, the trees haven't actually even uh, fully leafed yet. But as the, as the spring went on and the house began to be more built, uh, the trees began to leaf out more. We used artificial turf to be our grass. I, I would have loved to actually lay real grass down, but Central Park has, has a lot of very firm rules about invasive species. And it means that I, we had to use all artificial foliage. You can see my artificial uh, peach trees being built in the background here. Um, and then I had a, a brief moment as a landscape designer because I needed to, to landscape this whole house. So again, we had to find artificial versions of all these things, but I did a bit of research into what might you realistically have in a Georgia garden. And we had azaleas and red roses and honeysuckle and English ivy in places. And I gave all of this to my props master who went out and found artificial versions of all of it that we could dress the house with. Um, and here is the finished house with actors on it. Um, now I mentioned, you know, this is a house that is not physically transforming. It, it sat there as a solid object through the entire play. But because we were outdoors, the light around it transformed it radically. When the play started, it was still daylight and you can see a blue sky behind them. But fairly quickly, the sun went down and we moved into kind of the golden hour, the magic hour blue of, of an of a evening sky and then a fully nighttime look. And for a wedding at the end of the play, all of the vines around the house were full of Christmas lights, which could light up and make it feel more festive. And so the space transformed in that way. And suddenly the lights inside the house lit up and it began to have that coziness of, oh, I'm outdoors, but I could go indoors into this house. And that was, that was the way this transformed. And then within that, there were different story points we had to touch. Most of this story of Much Ado About Nothing all takes place around this mansion house. But there's one moment where one of the characters has pretended to die, her fiance has done something awful to her, or accused her of being unfaithful to him, and uh, she pretends to have, to have committed suicide, basically, to have died, died of, of being so ashamed of, of his accusation, his false accusation. Um, I suggested to the director that instead of trying to have a graveyard suddenly appear in this house's backyard, that we should do a little memorial. We should have some flowers and a portrait, but that should be a memorial to this dead character that we didn't really need to be in a graveyard. And that would make sense of it actually being in the backyard. And so that's what we did. And when we got to the scene the first time with an audience, we brought out this memorial portrait and suddenly the audience laughed. And I thought, well, that's not good. This is supposed to be a very solemn kind of sad scene. The audience knows she's not really dead but the, the character who is coming to pay homage to her does not know she's dead. And we have to feel bad that he's, he's realizing that he's falsely accused this woman um, and it, it shouldn't be a funny scene. And the director said, well, you know, maybe the audience is just nervous or, or who knows, let's try it again and see what happens. But for the next couple of nights, they kept laughing every time this portrait came out. And we thought, well, that's no good. And my director very astutely said, well, maybe it's the fact that her knee is up is what's funny. And I didn't know why that was funny, but we took a different picture. We tried this one. We put again, funeral flowers on it and we brought it out on stage. And lo and behold, the audience never laughed again. And I can't tell you why that first picture was funny and this one is not funny, but that seemed to be true. And that is some of the alchemy of doing a play. You can't tell what an audience is gonna to react to sometimes, but when they keep laughing at something that you don't want to be funny, you need to change it so that it's not funny. And likewise, if you think it's funny and they never laugh, well, you have to trust your audience and you have to change it and make it funny for them. Now, another moment that was an interesting exploration for me in this was I, I told you at the beginning of the show that the cast drove up in this car. Uh, I had originally suggested to Kenny that perhaps since we, we were intended, we weren't sure what this army was gonna be, but I brought him some pictures of, of technicals from Middle Eastern wars where a pickup truck has been actually converted into kind of a tank. And I said, if you really want this to be kind of an American civil war, perhaps they should drive up in something like this. And he thought about it for a while, but he said, you know what, that's too much. I don't want it to be quite that violent. And honestly, I feel like if I have a bunch of black people drive up in a pickup truck with a gun in the back, it's gonna make the white audience shut down and not even listen to the story. And I don't want that. Um, 
So instead, we ended up with something that was closer to a, a civil rights protest, frankly, to a Black Lives Matter rally, although we didn't call it that. This Again, this is 2019. This is a year before uh, the murder of George Floyd. And Black Lives Matter had a, had a different sort of context for people. So we were really trying to do kind of a civil rights rally. Um, and we used a bunch of, we had them march in with a bunch of placards uh, that some of them relate uh, related very directly to, to civil rights slogans from the past. Uh, others were referencing Black Lives Matter, but without quite using that logo. And this was Kenny, my director, who is a black man who lives in Atlanta, trying to kind of thread the needle and find a way to tell a story to this audience that would make his point, but also not make people shut down. And that was one of the lessons for me was, was how you tell the story, how you push the envelope or not to try to make your point clear to the audience. Um, a last little detail is I, you know, we built this house, but the doors would open at times and characters would come in and out. And so actually inside this house, I had a lot of rooms and all of those had to be dressed out with interiors. There were no scenes that ever took place there, but there were things in there so that as the audience glanced through these doors, you saw life inside them and you saw the live, the real lives of these people inside. And in the living room, there was a Barack Obama hope poster above the door. Again, we were trying to tell the story of a, of a wealthy Atlanta black family who were politically active. And that seemed like a nice way to help tell that story. Um, one final detail, and, and this has nothing to do with this particular play. It is in fact, every play I do, I've done in Central Park. As we build the set, um, we, we build up the stage and there's a series of joy, open joists under the stage. And invariably the local Central Park's ra Park raccoons move in to the open space under the stage and they have their babies under there. And so through the course of the summer, we start seeing baby raccoons appearing and they come out and spill across the stage. Occasionally, they'll even show up on stage during the show, but more often we see them backstage before and during the show. But I certainly saw evidence of them on stage. They climbed up into my fake peach trees and they tasted the peaches, but I guess they decided they didn't taste good. And later in the summer, when we were doing a technical rehearsal, one of them even came up and marched across the stage and checked out the lighting console to see how, how that was going. Um, again, unrelated to the show, but it's a fun detail of doing outdoor theater that, that you can't quite get away from nature. Um, finally, this is an aerial shot of the set. Uh, this particular production was filmed by, uh, by, PBA, by PBS for New York's local PBS station, and, and, and they uh, presented it later in the year. And they opened the show with an aerial drone shot, uh, kind of zooming in on the set from above. And as a theater set designer, I don't get this kind of thing very often where I can have a, a drone at whatever, you know, however, however tall this was, a thousand feet up, zooming in on my set. But it was fun. And the point of showing this is that it really did look like a real house um, until you got right up on top of it. Um, and that turned out to be one of the key things that, that helped this set tell the story. We were trying to take this Shakespeare play and make it a story about modern people living in Atlanta, about a modern wealthy black family and how they're relating to the world. And the reality of that house, as it turned out, set within this very real park with real trees was the thing that, that helped the set tell that story and, and helped support, support the themes of that show. Um, and so in a sense, the fact that this set didn't move, that it didn't transform was in fact the thing that helped thematically support what the show was about. Um, and so that, uh, that is what I have to tell you about today. I think we have a little time for Q&A. Um, and uh, if we uh, want to jump into that, we could do that for a few minutes. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Beowulf. That was fantastic. I, I'm just, there's, there's so much I'm thinking of. Um, imagination, creativity, collaboration, layering. Um, flexibility, everything that you have to uh, deal with is, is uh, really interesting. So um, so we have our first question in, um, and let's see, a uh, fake brick for alt set. Do you mean a brick veneer or plywood painted to look like brick? So talk about the materiality of that. Yes, so what that actually is, um, it's the, what we use for fake brick usually is, is vacuform. Um, I'm not sure that that architects will know what that is, but it's very thin plastic um, that we, you can make fairly cheaply and you can cast it on a mold in usually in sort of a four by eight segment that, uh, but it, you, it, you can buy it in a lot of different brick patterns, anything from a kind of a very pristine pattern to different kinds of end bricks showing to very kind of old falling apart brick. 
and depending on what the show is, it, it sort of depends what sort of brick I choose to use. Now that's very flimsy on its own. So that's why you, as you saw the construction shots, it was a plywood, plywood structure under that. So we kind of built the whole house, sheathed it in plywood, and then put this fake brick on top of it, which we painted to, to look like real brick. Um, the, the fake stuff on its own, really, it's, you, can, you can roll it up almost. It's, it's not very thick at all. And in fact, in those shots, the, the shingles are the same thing. It's this very thin plastic that we've painted to look like real shingles, but it has dimension to it. So light reacts to it. And if it's painted well, you really can't tell the difference. Um, I don't think it would hold up in a hurricane, but you know, for, for six or eight weeks out in the park, it usually lasts okay. So let's backtrack a little bit. Can you talk a, uh, a little bit more about your design process? What some of the creative tools are that you use and, and the collaboration process? Yeah, for me, um, and you know, in fact, I mentioned that I, I have written a book. The, the book is mostly about this. For me, the, it's a very collaborative form. I, I really work very intrinsically with whoever the director of the play is. And the best directors don't, they don't really come into the process knowing what they want the set to be. We tend to talk a lot about like, what is the flow of the show? What is the pace of the show? What's the rhythm of the storytelling? Um, and thematically, what are we trying to emphasize? And then I'll take that stuff from those conversations and start thinking, how do I turn that into a visual? You know, wh what, are the, what are the physical things I can put on stage that will support that visual or support that thematic narrative and, and also be able to transform in a way that rhythmically kind of plays into how the director wants to tell the story. Does it need to move quickly? Does it need, need to move slowly? Does this scene need to be quick, but this one needs to be slow? Um, and how can I kind of tie all those things together in a way that, that will support the storytelling? But, you know, as I said, it, theater, I really do think of it as literature. It is basically a written form and we are taking these written words and presenting them in some way. And the director is kind of the, the bus driver, so to speak. They're, the director's concept or how, what they want to emphasize in the show is the thing that I need to then tie into and figure out how do I support that in, in the best way. The costume designer will do the same thing. How do the costumes support that narrative? Ultimately, the lighting designer will do the same thing. All of the design staff are kind of working in the same direction. And it's the director's job to make sure we're all kind of moving in that direction. You know, we talk to each other, obviously, and it becomes a big collaboration, but the director is ultimately kind of the traffic cop, keeping all of it together, and then working with the actors, most importantly, so that they're telling the same story as well, that what they're doing and the way they're presenting the story ties in. So all of these ideas are coherent and all kind of working in the same direction. And when you, when you get the best shows, that, that's how it works. I'm sure everybody's seen plays where those things are not working well together. Um, and that's always disappointing. But that, um, that collaboration with the director to, to figure out how we're going to tell the story is, is kind of the most important thing for me. So you'd say you work with the director um, uh, most closely to develop your set design more Absolutely. than anyone else? Yeah, much more than anybody else. Certainly in, in the beginning, that's really the only person I'm working with. Um, I often, I mean, sometimes the playwright's not even alive, but even with a living playwright, usually the playwright will talk to the director and the director will talk to me. I'm, I'm not usually talking directly to the playwright. I'm more reading the playwright's words. And we may talk to each other. It's not that we're, we're kept apart, but you really need one person to kind of guide the whole thing. And the director is the person who does that. Once we get into the process, then, you know, the lighting designer is actually very important to me because the way the stage light hits the set and reacts to the set is going to show, it's, that's how the audience is going to see it. And stage lighting can either make a, you know, a set look great or look terrible. And I work quite closely as a lighting designer to, to figure out where the lights go. I try to make sure the set allows them to put lights in the places they need them to tell the story best. So that's also quite a close collaboration for me, but that comes a little further down the road. How do you balance the artistic and technical requirements of the job? Um, it's, a, it's a balancing act. I... Um, you know, the artistic part is, is the fun part and the technical part is, is the job part of it. Um, so, you know, I showed you a little bit of, of some of the technical drawings and some of the engineering that goes into it. I would say that's the technical part of it. You know, once, once I come up with these ideas that I've talked about and shown you guys today, um, I have to then create a set of drawings that a scene shop can build and then I have to supervise them. Now, I'm not there every day. I maybe show up once a week to look at what they're building or talk about, oh, if you know, we made this out of steel instead of wood, it would be lighter or heavier or stronger or whatever. Or you know, I want something that is difficult to engineer if we made it this way instead of that way. 
um, it would be it would be stronger, easier to build, or cheaper to build. Frankly, it often just comes down to budget. Um, you know, I can spend so much money on the set, and if I do one thing, it's going to be more expensive than another thing. Um, you know, I, I tend to click into technical head a little bit and think, you know, how many four bay eight sheets of plywood am I going to use to make this thing? And if I do it this way or that way, it'll be a little cheaper or a little more expensive or a little more durable or, or so on. Um, but I'm trying to take those technical things and balance them with what is, what is the thematic artistic drive that we're trying to communicate and not let the, let the, the sort of conceptual artistic drive get swallowed up in the technical ever. I know we didn't cover any of your projects in television tonight, but what are, what are some of the differences between designing sets for theater versus television? Um, you know, I haven't done very much television. I've done a little bit of it. And honestly, I am not so good at it. it what I have found in television is it's often a much more realis realistic uh, art form. There are certainly examples where it's not, but it's more location scouting. Or even if you're making a set from scratch, you're tending to be doing kind of very realistic detailed interiors. And I know how to do that kind of thing, but it doesn't interest me as much as the more theatrical stuff that I mostly showed you today. Um, the other thing that I found in television is you are just kind of a slave to the camera. One of the things that I, I love about theater set design is the way I'm de designing a set is kind of helping control the audience's eye. In act one, I, was, I showed you there were there sort of these very small rooms that helped kind of contain the space and make a person feel bigger or smaller or whatever. In, in film or television, a camera does all of that. So the set doesn't have to do any of those things. Um, and that sort of control of the composition is one of the things that I love in theater that, that is not part of the production designer's job in film or television. The other thing that has been my kind of limited experience in film and television is the pace of it is just very different. You're sort of, you're in a location for a day or two and you're kind of rushing to keep up with your shoot schedule for those couple of days. And everything is kind of a rush emergency the entire time. And I don't really like the tension of that. Theater is a schedule where I often start a year ahead of time figuring out what an idea is and I can kind of work through my ideas. And then we build the set carefully and then we put it in the theater and we spend maybe 10 days working the actors into it. You have fewer emergencies and there's, there's kind of less panic in theater, I, I have found. There are always some emergencies and something goes wrong and you have to fix it. But they, they are more contained moments. Um, and maybe I just happened to have worked on, on television shows that were, were always in a panic, but I found the, the stress of that I didn't enjoy so much and I like the slightly more contemplative pace of theater. Right, so following up on that, I think we have a comment from one of the attendees saying how they love uh, how suggestion and implication are part and parcel to set design, so. That's really, that's what I love about theater. It is, it allows, as I said at the beginning, it allows the audience to participate in a different way. And look, I love watching television. I love watching films, but it's, it's a different kind of a medium. Um, and the way um, a couple of objects on stage can suggest an entire mansion or suggest an ocean liner or whatever um, in conjunction with sound and light and an actor saying words, that magic and the, the sort of the audience participation of that. And I don't mean audience participation by audience comes up, coming up on stage and doing something, just literally the audience's imagination being engaged and being part of the story is, is really the thing that I love about theater. And I love as a designer trying to find what is the line, what is kind of the least amount of stuff I can put on stage to invite the audience in and have them be part of that. In your experience, how is set design ch changing over time? Uh, are you doing things today that you would not have done maybe five or 10 or 20 years ago or vice versa? And, and what explains these changes? Yeah, you know, one of the big changes is that video projectors have gotten much more cheap, much cheaper. So you can, you can rent a much more powerful projector than you used to be able to. And that explains why you see so much more video on stage than you used to, um, either in LED panels or projected light. But that stuff has all become affordable on, in theater in a way that it wasn't 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and I, not always to the good. I, I fear that sometimes that means people just put up a projection screen and project a literal backdrop and it kind of destroys the suggestiveness of theater. But when used right, video and projection can be a really powerful tool and they can be just as suggestive as anything else. And you know, talk about transformation, it's, it's ultimately transformative. It transforms as light because that's what it is. And so they're very powerful tools when used right, but when used wrong, they can kind of overwhelm a stage and you start to lose the actors in it. And, and that's when I don't like those things so much. 
Um, a flip side, uh, this, is, this is not about what you see on stage exactly, but the, the automation of uh, both construction and model building has, has pretty radically affected theater. Um, when I started out, I, I made all of my models with a soldering iron and, a, and an X-Acto knife and mat board. And now a lot of it I'm doing with laser cutting or 3D printing. I'll, I'll often do a kind of a virtual model in my computer and then send it out to a printer to get it printed. I, I still almost always create a physical model of the set because I wanna see what it's gonna look like in real space. But a lot of that I'm creating through uh, you know, th 3D drafting and 3D printing. And similarly, scene shops are able to, to do more and more things that way. And be we're beginning to 3D print scenery sometimes, but even when we're not doing that, CNC routing and, and laser cutting almost all scenery is built that way now. So it, it affects how I design. If I think that I can do something quite intricate often, if it can be thrown down on a laser cutter and have it 3D printed for me. Um, I also, I just, uh, the show I just did for Shakespeare in the Park was a set that was all in forced perspective and it was kind of New York City facades. And we did these elaborate cornices of New York City, uh, you know, uh, dental cornices with big corbels out of them. And they were all in forced perspective. And so they, meaning they, they get smaller as they move away from the audience. And we, we created those digitally in, in the computer and then sent them out to a, I think it was a nine axis laser cutter that could actually carve the thing out of a piece of foam for us. But it's a complicated piece of architecture where every piece of the, every dental is getting slightly smaller as it, as it recedes into the distance. And that kind of thing being affordable for, uh, uh, for theater is really, that was the first time I'd been able to afford that tech kind of technology. And it's opening up a whole different kind of design to me that I can, I can imagine something like that and actually afford to create it. So that, that's quite exciting to me as the technology opens those doors. So we're about out of time here. Uh, I do wanna squeeze in two additional questions quickly. So um, uh, one of two, uh, what do you suggest um, to an architect who wants to experience set design? What can they start with? And I guess this means uh, how can they get into the, to the business uh, um, you know, or other design students that wanna- Yeah. I'm trying to think what the best way to do that is there are a lot of set designers do start as architects. I did not, but there are some wonderful set designers who did start that way. Um, you know, honestly, most of them, I think, went to set design graduate school uh, to start to learn it. But if you don't want to take that jump and, and, you know, spend three years in school getting an MFA, you know, I think maybe just go work, go volunteer at a theater or see if you can shadow somebody and sort of see what the experience is. Um, I, my sense is that, you know, theater design is, it's, it's certainly less technically demanding than architecture, um, and it's probably much freer in terms of what you're able to do. You're still dealing with, you know, with a structure in relation to a human being, that kind of basic, that basic thing is the same, um, but it also is something that's, it's a much more temporary form. So, it, it takes some of the pressure off, to be honest. When I'm designing a set, I can come up with some crazy idea and it might be a terrible idea, but you know, the show is not probably only gonna run for a couple of months. So if it's a terrible set, it'll be gone after a while. Um, it also means if it's a great set, it'll also probably be gone after a while, but it's a much more ephemeral art form. It's kind of here today, gone tomorrow. And as I said, people experience it over a very set amount of time. And that's one of the, the biggest things that I find interesting about it is as it, as it moves and, and changes over a very set controlled period of time, you're actually controlling how the light hits it as people see it in each of those moments, as opposed to relying on the sun or you know, street lights or whatever, that it's, it's a much kind of shorter window that people are experience, experiencing the sculpture of set design. Yeah. Um, I sort of rambled off the question there, but I think um, you know, reach out to your local theater and, and just get a sense of what they do is, is a good way to kind of dip your foot in the water. Um, and, you know, if you have the time, maybe you know, just go volunteer someplace and, and sort of get to experience it or just say, I want to, I want to hang out and watch it. Theater people in general tend to be fairly open and, and free about that kind of thing. Um, and it's one of the things I love about the profession. It's, it is not the most lucrative profession in the world. Usually people can make a lot of money at it, but basically people do it because they love it. And it, it leads to a lot of happy people having fun doing what they're doing. So on that note, um, how how is uh, Broadway bouncing back from the pandemic, or more importantly, your practice and what you you know your role and what you've been doing? How are you bouncing yeah. back from those um, challenges? I, I wish I had a firm answer to that. Two months ago, I would have said it's bouncing back strong. I think that the Delta variant has shown a bit of thrown a bit of a wrench in the gears. But I've done a few shows so far this summer, and and Broadway is planning to reopen. I have shows reopening starting in September and all through the fall. We're 
we're either reopening shows or putting up new shows. And, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. I think they're, they're going to, everyone's going to be masked. Everyone's going to be vaccinated to be allowed into Broadway theaters. Um, and uh, hopefully it'll go okay. We'll see what happens. Um, but uh, it's, Broadway is unfortunately not something that can survive as a socially distanced medium. It's the shows are just too expensive. The real estate is too expensive. And, you know, even the biggest hit shows like Hamilton or Wicked or The Lion King, they, they just can't survive if you can only have a person every six feet. Um, there's, there's no way to make the economics of it work. So the, the way they're reopening is really the only way it can work. Um, and it's, even at the best of times, it is a it is a very tenuous business model. You know, as I said, some shows are big hits and make a lot of money, but two thirds of Broadway shows uh, don't make money and, in fact, lose their entire investment. And COVID is not going to make that any easier. So uh, I, I hope we get it beat soon. But it, it, we are we are reopening, and, and hopefully it'll work. The the first Broadway show actually opened last week, and they're beginning to follow suit. There's going to be a lot more in the next month or so. Hey, well, this has been super informative and I think inspired everyone listening tonight to get back into the theater. So um, thank you so much for your wisdom and we really appreciate it. Well, it's, it's, it's an honor to get to speak to everybody and thank you so much. Have, have a good evening. So next month, we welcome Emily hodling Ig, founder and president of EHT Traceries, who will talk about the unique connections between architecture, oral history, and memory as it pertains to the changing face of our nation's capital. You can find this and other Architecture Everywhere programs online at aiadc.com calendar. This concludes our program. Thanks again for joining us and take care, everyone.